Well, as you can see, we're back in the Olivet Discourse here this morning. And I want to remind all of you that the last time we were in the Olivet Discourse, we had looked at one of the major applications to that passage, and that was that God would be faithful to bring about the 70th week of Daniel and therefore all of his promises. Prior to that, we had looked at the proper interpretation of the Olivet Discourse. Now we're going to start transitioning to move verse by verse through the entire passage until we finish it up when we get into chapter 14. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at, in particular, what life will be like on earth as God pours his wrath upon the unregenerate world. Now remember, God's wrath is being stored up by all of those who will not repent and trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ. What's interesting is this morning, I'm claiming that this passage is primarily directed towards Jewish believers who will need to persevere during this time period. Now, evidence that this is a Jewish-centric or maybe you'd call it an Israel-centric passage is found in Mark 13, 14, where Jesus says, When you see the abomination that causes desolation, those who are in Judea are to flee to the mountains. Now, where does the abomination that causes desolation occur? Well, that's in Jerusalem, which is obviously in Israel. Where is Judea? Well, that's obviously in Israel. Now, saying that, certainly this passage applies to all believers for all time. Again, because we can see that God is faithful to his promises. But what Jesus is going to do in verses 5 through 13 is he's going to take us through a purview of the entire last seven years so that whether you're Jew or Gentile, if you come to faith during that last seven years, you will persevere and not be deceived. Why is that so important? Because the last seven years on earth is a time of what is unprecedented. The key word this morning is unprecedented. The last seven years is a time of unprecedented deception. It is a time of unprecedented warfare. It is a time of unprecedented martyrdom. It is a time of unprecedented hatred. As God pours his wrath upon the unregenerate world, they will lash out against one another, and they will lash out certainly against anyone who comes to faith in Jesus Christ during that time period. But the good news is, for all those who trust in Jesus, they will be serving an unprecedented Savior. A Savior who has promised that no matter what ethnicity you are, whether you're Jew or Gentile, if you'll come to him, he will spare you from the wrath to come, and he'll give you eternal life. That's the good news we'll be focusing on at the end. But let's begin by looking at how this last seven years is a time of unprecedented deception. Now, remember, as Jesus answers the disciples' questions, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled, he fills the answer completely with the 70th week. That's his answer. He's just looking at the future last seven years as recorded by both Matthew 24 and Mark 13. Now, the reason I mention that is because many of the events that occur within the last seven years are certainly things that are happening now during the church age, like martyrdom, warfare, etc. But they will be greatly intensified, or you might say they're on steroids in the last seven years. And so that's what we see here as Mark begins recording Jesus' answer to the disciples' question. Mark 13, verses 5 through 6, it says, And Jesus began to say to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will mislead many. Now, certainly during the church age, you and I can attest to the fact that there have been many false Christ who have led astray many. But in the last seven years, this will be greatly intensified. Why? Because after the rapture of the church, all you have are unregenerate, at least initially. Certainly, God does save people during the last seven years, But that's going to be the very minority report right after the rapture. And so, of course, many will be led astray. Now, I want to show you an interesting parallel passage that teaches the same thing. It's from the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2. The Apostle Paul's words are important when he teaches about the day of the Lord. The reason why is he takes more than likely his data right from Jesus' teaching in the Olivet Discourse. So I'm going to show you a passage here in 2 Thessalonians 2 where the fear that those in Thessalonica had 
was that they were living during the day of the Lord. And so Paul says, no, you can't be living during the day of the Lord because the first thing within it is this great falling away where many are misled. That I think Jesus is referring to, followed by the revelation of the man of lawlessness. And so this is what Paul said. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, he did not want them at Thessalonica to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by spirit or by word or by letter as though from us to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. So let's stop there in verse 2. The issue was you had those at Thessalonica who were hearing false teachers claim that they must be living during the day of the Lord because they're undergoing such severe persecution. In fact, notice here the very important the day of the Lord is already here. That verb, it's a perfect tense form of anistomy, which every time it's used either in participle form or as just a verb, when it's in the perfect tense in the New Testament, it always has to do with something that is already here. They thought they were already in the day of the Lord. They thought that they had missed the rapture. So do you see, it won't do any good for Paul to say, well, no, you didn't miss the rapture because you didn't miss the rapture. It's like telling a little boy or girl who says, why is the sky blue? And you say, because it looks blue. You don't add anything to the argument. So what he has to show them is that the first thing within the 70th week is the rebellion, the misleading of the many. Now, here I want to show you a slight problem that we have in our English versions. Notice in verse 3, it says, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the lawless one is revealed, the one destined for destruction. Notice what I have underlined there. That day will not come. All of those words are italicized. And the reason why they are italics is because they are not original to the Greek text. They must be supplied by the English translator for this to make sense. The problem is, notice, the English translator switches from something that is already here to a future-oriented idea when they supply what's called the apotesis here. So let me point to the screen and point that out. Notice the logic is that the church thought that the day of the Lord was already here. But all of a sudden, our English translators switch to a future-oriented idea, will not come. So the way this should be rendered, and by the way, there's a wonderful article written by Robert Thomas on our website, and uh, it's the external links portion of our website, Robert Thomas talks about how this passage should be understood. Notice the way it should be rendered logically is that if the day of the Lord was already here, what Paul is saying is let no one deceive you in any way for that day is not here unless the rebellion comes first. In other words, this filled in apotesis has to to be built off of that verb. Okay, and if this is talking about something that's already here, why are they switching to something that's in the future? No, they thought the day of the Lord was already here. And so Paul is saying, no, the day of the Lord can't be here unless what? The rebellion comes first. That's the first thing within the 70th week, followed by the lawless one being revealed, the one destined for destruction. Now, the thing that I want to focus on is notice Paul is teaching the same thing that Jesus is. He says the rebellion comes first. Notice, not just a rebellion, the rebellion. The rebellion. In fact, the term rebellion comes from apostasia. The noun always has to do with either a spiritual or a political defection. And one of the advantages of being in 2 Thessalonians 2 is you don't have to choose between which it is. It's both. Because in the last seven years, the world is going to rebel spiritually against God, but also politically as they build Babylon. Jesus comes to bring the capital to Jerusalem. The world is trying to build political and spiritual Babylon. So the rebellion is a rebellion both spiritually and politically against God. And the reason it's so prominent is because after the rapture, again, that's all you have for a period of time, are the unregenerate. In fact, listen to what Robert Thomas says, the great scholar in the book of 2 Thessalonians. He says this, he says, quote, after the catching away of those in Christ by the rapture, all who are truly in him will be gone. Conditions will be ripe for people, especially those who call themselves Christians but are not really such, to turn their backs on God in what they do as well as in what they already have in thought. 
He says, then their insincerity will demonstrate itself outwardly. This worldwide anti-God movement will be so universal as to earn for itself a special designation, the rebellion. In other words, he says, it's the climax of the increasing apostate tendencies evident before the rapture of the church, unquote. What I love about Thomas's quote there is he acknowledges, yes, there are apostate tendencies now during the church age, but in the last seven years, it'll be greatly, greatly intensified. I think that's exactly what Jesus is referring to when he says the many will be misled. Now, one other issue we want to wrestle with here is notice in verse 6, Jesus says many will come. Many will come in his name for claiming to be a Christ. That's the implication. Now, the reason we have to wrestle with that is, remember, what Jesus is saying is really parallel to what we have in the opening verses in Revelation 6. And yet, in Revelation 6, verses 1 through 2, it talks about one Antichrist. So Jesus is talking about many. How do we reconcile the many versus the one? Well, the way we do that is by looking at other passages. And what we find in Revelation is that this one Antichrist comes from many contenders. And I'll show you data and evidence that suggests that here. Now, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 17. I'll have 13 on the board, but I'll have you be turning to Revelation 17 in just a moment. Remember, as we're studying Revelation, from chapters 4 all the way to 22, we're, we're studying this in the Sunday school, those chapters are sequential or chronological. But periodically, throughout those chapters, John will give you basically a section where he wants to focus on something. I like to call it an interlude. And so, for instance, he'll say, I want to focus on this subject or that subject, and then he does an interlude that isn't necessarily chronological. That's what we have in Revelation 13 when he talks about the career of Antichrist. Listen to where he comes from. He comes from the many. Revelation 13, verses 1 through 3. It says, in the dragon, remember that's Satan in context with Revelation 12. Satan stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. Now, let's stop there in verse 1. Notice this beast that comes out. He has ten horns and seven heads. And you're probably wondering, what in the world are those things? And I was wondering the same thing, but the good news is that John tells us what they are. So that's why you have your Bibles open to John chapter 17. Notice notice in verses 10 through 13, John describes what these are. Notice in Revelation 17, 10, he says regarding the seven heads that they are seven kings. Then he says, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, And when he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. So let's stop there. Let's unpack that. What we see is that these seven heads represent seven consecutive kings or kingdoms that have come against the people of Israel that's referred to back in Revelation chapter 12. And so those seven kingdoms, it really began with Egypt. And then it was Assyria. Then it was Babylon, Medo-Persia. Then it was Greece. In fact, Greece had Antiochus Epiphanes IV, which was really a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. Well, then those five had gone away, and the kingdom that was present during John's day was that of Rome. But one day that would also be subdued, and there would be these ten horns. That's the seventh kingdom, and the Antichrist himself would come from them. Okay, so that's what that's about. Now, what about the ten horns? Well, he tells us. Verse 12, it's not a mystery. He says, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but, now here's the key verse, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. Let's stop there. Antichrist doesn't emerge alone, does he? He comes with the many. Almost a distortion of the one and the many with Christ and his people. Verse 13, he says, these have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. So I don't think there's any discrepancy then between Jesus talking about the many who come 
and it ends up being boiled down to the one. In fact, in Daniel chapter 7, there's evidence that there's warfare initially between the Antichrist and these ten horns because in Daniel 7, 8, and in Daniel 7, 20, three of those kings end up being destroyed and having to be replaced. All right? Now, the other thing, let's just keep reading here in Revelation 13, verse 2. It says, And the beast, again, that's the Antichrist, which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. So he has great prowess. We'll talk about more of that when we get to Revelation. It says, And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Then in verse 3 it says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. Now there's the pseudo-resurrection. And then he goes on to say, And the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Now when does that happen in the chronology? We're not sure. But we know that's exactly what Jesus is talking about, that the many would be led astray. Paul talks about the rebellion. It will be worldwide as the majority fall away after Antichrist. And so in our application this morning, what I'll show you is the way to be guarded against deception, whether it's now in the church age or for those who will come to faith during these last seven years, it is to cultivate a love for the truth. Cultivate love for, of the truth that comes particularly from the scriptures. That's the stopgap, and that's what the world wants to reject. They don't love the word of God. Now, the next great catastrophe that we see in the last seven years is that it is a time of unprecedented warfare. Certainly, war has always been part of mankind. We know it in the church age. In fact, that's the one thing you may say that man is good at is killing one another very sadly. But yet again, it will be so intensified in the last seven years that it will really serve as a warning and a sign to those who come to faith. In fact, turn your Bibles to Revelation 6, verses 3 through 4. Revelation 6, verses 3 through 4. This is right after Antichrist is revealed, we see war break out. Revelation 6, verses 3 through 4, it says, When he broke, that's of course Christ, the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. So warfare will break out. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus teaches. In verses 7 through 8, he says, When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. Now let me stop there in verse 7. Notice Jesus says, when you see these wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Why would he say that in light of such horrific warfare? Well, I believe the reason he tells, again, a primarily Jewish audience not to be frightened is because, remember, Israel has a covenant with Antichrist for the first, right, for seven years. And so for the first three and a half, Antichrist honors that. They have protection in Israel, as it were. In fact, if you look at Daniel, write this down, 11, 39, and 40, the warfare that initially breaks out is in the Gentile world, not in Israel. But according to Daniel 9, 27, at the three-and-a-half-year mark, Antichrist turns against Israel. It also says that in Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. So, what we can conclude is the reason they shouldn't be frightened is because they have protection. But that's why Jesus says in Mark 13, 14, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, now we're at the midpoint, then what does he say? He says basically, now be afraid. Now flee to the mountains if you're in Judea. And so again, I think that this supports that Israel-centric nature of this passage. So they are not to be frightened now, but he says in verse 8, he says, For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Now, the warfare is going to be so severe that it leads to great famine. A famine that is so severe that in the book of Revelation, it declares that there will be a day where it will take a whole day's wage for a man just to have one meager meal, let alone fill his children or his wife with food. A day's wage. 
And so there's going to be starvation on a massive scale. In fact, the same idea is taught in Revelation 6.8. Here, death and Hades are personified. It says, authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword. That's synonymous with warfare and with famine and with pestilence and by all the wild beasts of the earth. God had promised his people Israel in the Old Testament. You can read about this in Deuteronomy 28 that if they would break covenant with him, he would send judgment. And the judgment would consist of sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts. And so the idea is that the warfare would be so severe that the natural order and civilization itself would break down. And so people would end up starving and being susceptible to sickness. Now I want you to think about the great dream of the communist movement. The communist movement is perhaps one of the most dangerous false religions that has ever infected the world because, believe it or not, they murdered more people than even Islam has. Communists murdered more people in the 20th century than any other false religion. And what is the great Marxist, or what we would call in America today, the progressive dream? That one day each would have according to their need. That's their dream. That's their utopia. One day, through human effort, all will have according to their need. And yet, what do the scriptures say? No, a time is coming when no one will have according to their need. And so the world has a choice. You either believe Jesus Christ and his apostles, or you're going to believe Karl Marx. That's the issue in America today. Do you believe Karl Marx and you're going to build utopia, or do you believe Jesus Christ and therefore flee from the wrath to come. But you can't do both. This warfare is so severe, and the famines associated with it, notice it kills a fourth of the earth, and yet Jesus says about this same time period, it's just the beginning of birth pangs. In fact, when you get to Revelation 14, there's warfare that's so severe that for 200 miles there's bloodshed that says it rises up to the bridle of a horse. Now how figurative that is, I'm not sure. But that's a lot of bloodshed. And yet today, brothers and sisters, you're going out into a world of the peace symbol. People who say that there is peace, just as it was in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah chapter 6, they're crying peace when there is no peace. To me, the peace symbol is the, one of the greatest pieces of irony in all of history. It is a broken cross, and ironically, the only way that the world can have peace is through the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, through his cross. And through that cross, you have peace with God, and one day in the Millennial Kingdom, peace with man. But the broken cross of the peace movement and the Marxist movement says humanity will do it. Brothers and sisters, they're building Babylon. Christ is going to bring Jerusalem. Which city will you live which speaker will you listen to? Is it Christ or is it the word of Antichrist who's come in many different forms already in many false religions? Brothers and sisters, the world isn't heading towards utopia. It's heading towards unprecedented warfare. That's the truth of the matter and that's what happens in the last seven years. It's also heading towards unprecedented martyrdom for those who do come to faith during this time period. Turn your Bibles just ahead now, Revelation 6, 9 through 10. <clears throat> this is at the fifth seal. It says, when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, John says, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. So let's stop there. Why were these killed? Because of their testimony with the word of God. They were martyred because they belonged to Christ. Verse 10 it says, And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Let's just keep going in verse 11. It says, And there was given to each of them a white robe. And they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. This time period will be a time period of unprecedented martyrdom. It will be rare if you're not martyred, is the implication, I think, if you belong 
to Jesus Christ. And this is what Jesus was saying again in Mark 13, verses 9 through 11. He says, But be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. By the way, let me stop there. Verse 9, testimony to them, it could be rendered a testimony against them. That's how that same passage is understood, the same Greek construction in Mark 6, 11. Why? Because the majority don't believe. It serves as a testimony against them, a date of a disadvantage. Now, in verse 10, it says the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Let's stop there. Yes, certainly the gospel is being preached now during the church age. It is going out to all the nations. But you know that will happen with great intensity during the last seven years? We just read in Revelation 6 where people will be martyred for giving the gospel. Revelation chapter 11, you have the two witnesses who come in the spirit and power. You get the idea of like Moses and Elijah. And they proclaim the gospel. Revelation 14, 6, it says this. It says there was another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. God is so loving. God is so caring. God is so concerned for those who are perishing that he even in this last hour gives them multiple last chances. The gospel will be preached with great intensity in these last seven years. But the majority, again, will remain unconvinced because, as we'll see later, they don't have a love for the truth. Now, notice in verse 11 of Mark 13, he says, When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Notice here, it says, When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand what you are to say. This is the favorite prayer of a seminarian who is not prepared for their Greek or Hebrew exam. Oftentimes, I think many a seminarian appeals to this and says, oh Lord, just let the Holy Spirit speak through me on my grammar exam. Let me assure you that that's not what is intended here. The reason I mention that is now as we're living during the church age, we are called according to 1 Peter 3.15 to sanctify Jesus as Lord in our hearts And always be prepared to give an apologia, a reasoned defense from all those who ask us for the reason for the hope that dwells within us. We are called now to give a reasoned defense. So what's being promised here is that in these very dire circumstances, yes, God will supernaturally speak through his people, but you and I now are called, 1 Peter 3.15, to be prepared to give a rational defense. So don't try to say, I'm not going to prepare and cite this verse. No, prepare yourselves, brothers and sisters, to give a rational defense here and now to those who ask with gentleness and respect. Okay, so unprecedented martyrdom. Now, the final thing we look at is that this time period is also a time period of unprecedented hatred where even family will turn against one another and children will rebel against their mother and father Think about the fifth commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. The fifth commandment is the only commandment that has a promise attached to it. Honor your father and mother so that your days would be prolonged in the land. And God goes on to say in Deuteronomy 28, verse 53, that if Israel would rebel against his covenant, one of the signs of his fury and wrath being poured out was that the siege and warfare would be so severe that sons and daughters would turn against their mothers and fathers, and mothers and fathers would even eat their own children. In fact, in Ezekiel 5.10, Ezekiel prophesies, and this very thing happens during the destruction of Jerusalem in 5.86. Ezekiel 5.10, he says, Therefore fathers will eat their sons among you, and sons will eat their fathers, for I will execute judgments on you and scatter you to every wind. That's how severe it will be. Hatred will be on steroids during the last seven years. Greatly intensified, and Jesus talks about this time period. Mark 13, 12 through 13, he says, Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now, more than likely, 
Jesus here is citing, perhaps most scholars think it's probably from Micah 7, 6. Let me show you. Micah 7, 6 talks about the sinfulness of Samaria and Judah, that they were so sinful that, again, the hatred broke out even amongst family members. Listen to what he said back in the 700s B.C. He said, For son treats father contemptuously. Daughter rises up against daughter. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. That's exactly what it will be like in the last seven years. And I want you to think about is the wrath of God comes when you have warfare and you have famine and people have so little. Can you see how tempting it would be for family members to get rid of a Christian family member? Hand them over to one of the representatives of the beast? After all, they might get a little bit more food. And they'll gladly hand over their family members. And so, brothers and sisters, what we have then in the last seven years is that the very plank, the very bedrock of society, the family itself will disintegrate as family members turn against one another. And it is the final way that God can say, your faith is in Christ alone. You don't even have your family members you can trust upon. Christ alone is where faith must be. And those who trust in Jesus Christ, the beautiful benefit is that then they will be transferred out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, and then they will be part of the eternal family of God. I know, Bob, that was one of your favorite songs. You're so grateful, I think the song was, to be in the family of God. That's the great hope that we have. That's what Bob has been teaching us about. It's an extraordinary thing being an ordinary Christian because you may not have an earthly family, but you'll have the family of God that lasts forever. Brothers and sisters, the last seven years are going to be a horrific time. And my prayer is that as we look at these things, it would cultivate a love for the lost and those who are perishing. Put a deep desire in us that we would preach the gospel and warn them that they must repent and believe and not suffer these terrific things. Notice here, by the way, at the end of verse 13 in Mark 13, 13 there, he says, the one who endures to the end will be saved. The end there should be seen as the end of the tribulation period. Now that happens to coincide with the end of the church age or the age that we live in. The messianic age comes after that. But again, I think the end here is in particular the end of the 70th week. Because next time, by the way, we get to chapter 13, verse 14, by recapitulation, Jesus brings us back to the midpoint. And he talks about the abomination that causes desolation. That's how it's structured. Okay, now let's go back to some applications here. I want to begin with number one, that those who do not believe in Christ today will gladly receive the Antichrist tomorrow. And as I'm going to show you on the next slide, the reason why people are so quick to run to false Christs, false messiahs, false teachers is because they don't have a love for the truth. And so having a love for the truth is something that we all want to cultivate in our own lives. Number two, we must be convinced of and content with the wrath that begins in Daniel's 70th week. Let me explain. You and I, if we're not convinced that the wrath of God is real, if you and I just yawn when we hear about these warnings, where is the unregenerate going to hear the bad news? Can you imagine if a, no doctor would ever want to say that someone had cancer? You'd have all these people walking around with cancer and no one has the guts to tell them? Brothers and sisters, we have to be convinced of it. It can't be just pie-in-the-sky thinking. But yet we also have to be content with the wrath of God and not see the wrath behind every tornado or illness that befalls the other guy. Let's be content with warning people about the wrath to come. Number three, we must remember that Christ has spared us from this time. That's our great hope. We have not been destined to wrath, but obtaining salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, okay, let's begin with number one. Those who reject Christ receive Antichrist. Think back in your minds. I'm sure that all of you have read this passage at one time. In John chapter 5, in verse 43, remember Jesus is debating with his compatriots, fellow Jews. And he tells them that they will not receive him even though he came in his father's name. But one who comes in his own name, they will gladly receive. That's John 
Now think about that. Jesus comes in the Father's name, and the world won't have it. Now, Jesus, we have to think about, is the apostle par excellence. He is the sent one. In fact, he's God himself. He is the one that Moses had predicted in Deuteronomy 18, that from the countrymen of Israel, God would raise up a prophet, and if they wouldn't listen to him, it would be required of them. And yet, when he comes on the scene of history, they won't listen to him who came in the Father's name. But when the Antichrist comes on the scene... In the 70th week, they'll gladly receive him. And so will the world. Why? Well, Paul tells us why. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's because they do not have a love for the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 12, Paul says, Then that lawless one, he's talking about the Antichrist, will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Now, let me just stop there. I love in verse 8, when Jesus destroys the Antichrist, notice he doesn't have to call in aircraft carriers or napalm strikes or great artillery barrages. How does he get rid of the Antichrist? With the breath of his mouth and the appearance of his coming. That's power. Praise be to Jesus for that. Now, keep going. Verse 9, still talking about the Antichrist. It says, that is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness." Brothers and sisters, notice here, why is it that God will send this deluding influence? Notice it's because they did not receive a love of the truth. Notice it's not they didn't receive the truth. It's that they did not receive the love for the truth. In other words, I think the issue here is not a cognitive one. It's not a problem with intellect. The unregenerate can understand the words that we are saying, although certainly sin affects even our intellect. But the issue was a moral one. The unregenerate, I think, understand what we're saying at a cognitive level. They want nothing to do with it. They hate the things of God. They hate the truth. Now, further evidence of that is notice down in verse 12. It says, they took pleasure in wickedness. Notice they have an affection and a love for wickedness, but they don't have a love for the truth. It's a moral problem. The gospel has been clearly preached, but they hate the things of God. And so, brothers and sisters, I think what you and I have to glean from that is we have to cultivate a love for the truth, meaning we have to be people of the book because God's word is what defines reality. One of the greatest blessings that I have as a pastor, and I know I'm speaking for the other elders here and Bob, I know uh, Adam would say the same thing, we love it when you love the truth. And that's one thing that I love about this congregation is to see you have such a love for the truth found in God's word. Never depart from that. Why? Because God's word defines reality. Not Karl Marx, not the Antichrist, not any other guru, the word of God. Funny story R.C. Sproul tells. R.C. Sproul talks about God's word defining reality. And he talked about a bumper sticker that really annoyed him. Now, it's subtle. Listen to this. The bumper sticker that annoyed him was where it says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Now, what's wrong with that? The middle phrase, I believe it. He says, no, whether you believe the word of God or not, God said it, that settles it. God's word is that which defines reality. And you and I must conform our attitudes towards the scriptures rather than the scriptures towards our attitudes on our preconceived notions. Think about this last couple of weeks. We had this great march. I mean great in the sense of large, not that it was magnificent in any way. 300,000 people marched in New York City. And you know what their concern was? It wasn't the wrath of God that we've been talking about. It was global warming. Global warming. They're convinced that they must be spared from that catastrophe despite all of the evidence to the contrary. In fact, let me read to you 
some evidence that global warming isn't happening. This comes from an article. This is ABC News, not exactly a conservative source, just this past week. It says, quote, Last week, sea ice from the Antarctic Climate and Ecosystems Cooperative Research Center says sea ice in the South Pole covered more than 20 million square kilometers for the first time since records began, unquote. More sea ice in the South Pole than has ever been recorded before. Now, people must say, well, the, the Arctic, the North Pole, must really be in bad shape if there's still global warming. No. The Arctic Ocean is also expanding its ice fields. This is from the Daily Mail UK. This is last week as well. Quote, seven years after predicting an ice-free Arctic by Al Gore, the Arctic ice cap, this is the North Pole, has expanded for a second year in a row. An area twice the size of Alaska, America's biggest state, was open to water two years ago and is now completely covered in ice. In 2012, they went from 3.91 million square kilometers of ice in the Arctic to now 5.62 million square kilometers in 2014. That's the Daily Mail. So as the earth is increasing in ice, you have 300,000 people say, save us from global warming. And then when you and I tell them to be spared from the wrath of God, they scoff at that. Why? Because they do not have a love for the truth. God's word has demonstrated itself to be 100% accurate every time. Ezekiel 26, did not God predict 254 years in advance with great precision the destruction of Tyre? Did he not predict the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and the Roman empires to come about? Certainly he did. And it's demonstrated itself to be 100% accurate every time. And yet they won't believe it. Why? Because they don't have a love for the truth. Brothers and sisters, never, ever lose your love for the truth. Whether it be in general revelation, but especially in the special revelation, the scriptures themselves. Cultivate that. Never leave it behind. Okay, now let's move on to the second one. We must be convinced of and content with the coming wrath. What do I mean by convinced of? If you and I aren't convinced of the wrath of God and we just yawn at these things, we say, oh, that's just pie in the sky thinking, God is certainly never going to send this kind of wrath. Who will believe it? The unregenerate certainly won't. Think about John 3.36. Think about this great reality. Jesus says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son does not have the life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, the term abides there, meno, means to remain. And the idea there is wherever the unregenerate go, the wrath of God is always upon them. Now, you can't see it, but the point is God's anger is against them. And so if you and I don't believe, again, the words from Scripture, who will? We have to be convinced that this wrath is real so that we will lovingly warn people, just as a doctor would lovingly warn somebody if they really had cancer. Now, we also have to be content with the wrath of God. And that means the coming wrath. Why do I say that? Some years ago, I had the opportunity of working with a ministry. And one of the problems that I saw in this ministry was that they saw the wrath of God behind every tornado, every terrorist event, every bad thing that happened. Now, what's the problem with saying that such and such a tornado is the wrath of God? The problem is we don't have an authoritative apostle and prophet to tell us that is indeed the case. So you and I during the church age, when we don't have authoritative apostles and prophets, we can end up making the same error that Jesus' disciples did. Remember in John chapter 9, there was a false assumption that the disciples had. They asked Jesus about the man born blind. Was it his Mother's and, mother and father's sin that he was born blind or was it his own? It had to be someone's sin that the wrath of God was the idea is now upon him. But what does Jesus say? It was neither, but that the glory of God would be revealed through him. Brothers and sisters, you and I don't know whether any given thing is the wrath of God. And ironically, what we see in Scripture is Scripture itself shows us that we should be content about warning people about the coming wrath, whether it be the beginning part of the 70th week or the future lake of fire. That's what we have to be con- content in warning people about. So let me show you evidence of this. Romans 12, 19. 
Paul says, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Notice the vengeance is mine, I will repay. That comes from that Deuteronomy 32, 35. It's that very famous text that Jonathan Edwards ended up preaching his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Remember that passage goes on to talk about how their foot would one day slip. So yes, God will one day judge all those who are not found in his Son. In fact, notice in red, he says, leave room for the wrath of God. Now, what's interesting is of God, again, is supplied by the English translators. And I think they're absolutely correct. But realize in the Greek, it's literally leave room for the wrath. Now, why can Paul just say the wrath? Because he assumes that his audience knows he's referring to the wrath to come. And so notice the New Testament writers themselves aren't telling people that they're always under the wrath of God now, but rather they are in jeopardy of the wrath to come. That's what you and I have to be content in warning people about. If we start saying that every single thing that happens here now is the wrath of God, people say, well, I can handle that. I survived that. It desensitizes them to it. Let me show you another example of this. Luke 3, 7. This is John the Baptist. And so it says, He began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers. Let's stop there. That's called the direct approach. <laughs> you brood of vipers. He's not cushioning it, is he? You brood of vipers who warned, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. To come there comes from the participle form of the verb mellow, which means to, uh, it's about to. It's imminent. It's the idea it's at hand. So I like that rendering. It's the wrath to come. Notice what John the Baptist doesn't say. He doesn't say, who told you to flee from the wrath that's now being poured upon you? After all, didn't you see that earthquake or didn't you see that sickness or didn't you see that flood? No, he warned them to flee from the wrath to come. Brothers and sisters, so should you and I. Now, let me give you an objection that I've thought of myself. Romans 1.18. Doesn't Romans 1.18 say that the wrath of God is currently being revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness? Oh, yes, it is. But in Romans 1, what does that lead to? Hardening. Unbelief. So that they end up worshiping the creation rather than the creator who's forever praised. And then it culminates in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, where it says that they are storing up wrath for the future day of wrath. That's when the wrath will be experienced, is when the 70th week breaks forth. But realize the 70th week isn't the end of it, brothers and sisters. The bad news gets even worse because we know one day the 70th week will one day yield after the millennium into the lake of fire. The bad news for the unregenerate world can't be any worse. To be under the wrath of God, not just temporarily for seven years, but one day eternally in the lake of fire. But dear ones, that's where the good news of the gospel shines. That's where the good news of the gospel is so beautiful. The good news is that God has sent forth his Son. It was the plan of God from the ages that the Son who existed as God and with God from all eternity that he would humble himself at a point in time through a virgin birth and become a man. And that he would live the perfect life that none of us could. So that by faith in him, his righteousness could be credited to our account so that we could stand before God. But he also went to a cross to pay off our debt. 1 Peter 3.18 says he died once for all the just on behalf of the unjust in order that he might bring us to God. So he took the full measure of God's wrath upon himself that you and I deserve to be punished with And he paid it off, so now it is far away as the east is from the west. Jesus did that for us through his substitutionary death on the cross. Now, evidence that he accomplished these things was that after he died and was placed in the ground, on the third day, he rose again. And his resurrection proves all of his claims. It proves that he is our righteousness. He is our atonement. In this Jesus, then, what did he do? He taught about the kingdom of God for 40 days. Over 500 people saw him at one time. This wasn't something done in the secret. And then he ascended into the heavens where he's seated at the right hand of the Father, where he lives to make intercession for us. And it's promised that he's coming again to save his people, but to bring wrath that we've been talking about today. What must we do to be saved? Jesus commands, not a helpful suggestion, but, 
It's a command. Mark 1.15, he says, repent and believe the gospel. Repentance has to do with a change of mind and a turning. A turning from sin, self, and serving the world, and turning to God on his terms, which is faith alone in Christ alone. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God the Father, it says, made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If there's someone that doesn't know Jesus here today or listening via internet, today is the day to repent, trust upon Jesus Christ, and you will have eternal life, never to be subject to the wrath of God we've been talking about today. Now, let me end with this. This is the wonderful news that I want to remind all of you of that I'm sure you know as my dear brothers and sisters. 2 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul says, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord. See how tender that is? Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Steve Ziff has been doing, I saw him somewhere, Steve Ziff has been doing a wonderful job on Wednesday nights teaching us about the sovereignty of God. How fitting is this passage? God has chosen us for salvation, not for wrath. Never forget it. Let me show you another passage that teaches the same thing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Remember, just six verses earlier, what was the discussion? The day of the Lord's wrath. And just six verses later in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Paul says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, no matter what problems you have in this life, here and now, financial, family, medical, if you've been spared from the wrath of God, and if you've trusted in Christ, you have. You have the world by the tail. Never forget to thank God out of a heart of gratitude for what you've been spared. Bob in Sunday school today was teaching us about how God gives grace to the humble. That's one of the most important attributes that you and I can conjure up by God's spirit by remaining faithful. I'm sorry, thankful rather than faithful. Remaining thankful for what he has done for us, who is faithful. Brothers and sisters, never forget you've been spared from the wrath of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. For your great promises that a kingdom is coming for us. That we have been spared from these horrific things. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would not shrink back. That we would continue to persevere. We continue to believe the truth. We would continue to contend for the faith and be those who are convinced of these things. Brother, I ask that my brothers and sisters here would be given opportunities in the weeks and months ahead. To proclaim the wrath and also the gospel to those who are perishing. Let us not be those who are ashamed or afraid of talking about reality, but let us lovingly warn those who are going to destruction. I pray, Heavenly Father, you give us opportunities, that you would give us your words, and that you would soften hearts before us as we proclaim your gospel to our loved ones, to our family, to our friends that they also would trust upon Jesus, giving you great glory and to be spared from the wrath to come. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me give you the words of benediction now. Jude 24, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday and have a wonderful week.